video, we're going to look at essentially the discipline of what we'll term the mimic. And that requires a few different elements, but essentially the idea behind the mimic is to reflect the traits of the chameleon, which is a creature that will transform itself or modify itself to blend into the environment. Thus, it has control over its own appearance relative to those that are looking at it. And that would be through the camouflage and as it relates to light and the area around it so that it looks to be a part of the environment of which it actually is not. So it appears to be, but it really isn't. And naturally with chameleons, after you look for a while, you might actually spot them. So the camouflage works, but to de the determined eye, it can come apart. Now, as far as the mimic goes, one of the techniques used to hide itself in such an environment, we will look at through the idea of a map overlay. Now, what a map overlay is, generally, comes from a blank, generally, usually plastic sheet, which is placed over the surface of a map. And then a person can trace um, things or elements or put plans or notes or things like that on the overlay without actually affecting the map itself underneath. Now imagine if somebody uses an overlay for a different purpose, such as placing the a completely different location of a map sketch over another map. Those things aren't going to add up. And then if that person comes along and says, no, this is the correct map, even though the things don't line up, it will cause a confusion, a disturbance, and lead to misdirection. Now, overlays are also known in the context of photos, which, when applied, can change the nature of a picture in many different ways. But it is generally the same idea as the map overlay, in which you are modifying something by placing something over it. But you are not, in fact, modifying the original. You're simply changing the perspective with which that original is seen. Now, the first overlay that we're going to look at starts with the account of Perseus, the alleged fictional entity of a uh, person that is um, described in, in a mythical context, as they say, that cut the head off of the Medusa, the proverbial Gorgon, or creature that could turn individuals to stone and was in fact a being, fictionally anyway, and was capable of all sorts of things in the Perseus course, as the story goes, cut the head off the Gorgon, or Medusa, by looking in the reflection of a shield. Of course, there's different versions of this fictional story, or of the fictional story, anyway, the overlay account. And, of course, the Medusa was depicted as having a head uh, or hair of snakes. Now, as far as the shield of Perseus goes, for many, or perhaps few, there is a basic understanding about diffraction of light and how light affects vision. The chameleon, for instance, changes itself to the environment with an understanding of how to manipulate light and light diffraction. Something submerged underwater appears different than it does uh, on land because of the diffraction of light. Uh, rays or light waves, some might term them. And then naturally we have 
the flashbang and other types of uh, blinding devices that might cause somebody to proverbially turn to stone, uh, just like with the example in the rear window movie in which a uh, high, res high flash, high light flash uh, from a old camera was used as a blinding effect, causing somebody to be stunned, essentially. And then we also use corrective lenses to change people's ability to see far or near, depending on what apparent issues they have. And then we use the telescope to see things that are very, very far away, or possibly a microscope to see things that are extremely small but close. Also, the kaleidoscope will help us see a variety of colors or we can see light in different ways and different colors through all of the elements that are contained within a kaleidoscope and by rotating it, which naturally, if you think about the implications of such a simple thing as a kaleidoscope, usually a cheap uh, piece of memorabilia, something that tourists buy at, um, at tourist shops and whatnot, it does give us a complete understanding, a completely different understanding of other ways that we can look at light and how light can be changed where the light itself doesn't change its nature, but how we see it is changed based off of the medium through which we are looking at it just with the idea of an overlay. It also has terms as the Perseus and Medusa overlay, the Egyptians on various crowns and headdresses had the snake at the crown, thus a head with the snake on it. Also with the Adam and Eve story of the Garden of Eden, it's always depicted as a literal garden with two literal people and a snake who teaches about the uh, fruit from the tree, generally depicted as a literal apple, and of course the whole thing's a myth and fictionalized, right? And it couldn't be, you know, metaphorical or anything like that. And the snake teaches about good and evil, which can also be seen, as, or the knowledge of good and evil, which could actually be seen as something called duality. Uh, good and evil, right? Right and wrong. Uh, two, one choice of two options, two-party system. Etc. It removes any possibility for other variations or other explanations. It, it's very simple. Black and white, this choice or that choice. But usually when such a thing is applied as duality, both choices are equally the same, They're equally controlled by the same individual in the middle who you're not taught to see because you're too busy looking at one or the other. And of course this relates to double speak, speaking with the forked tongue, and all of these other terms to represent the trick, the swindle of duality, or what could also be termed as the knowledge of good and evil. Now the next overlay we're going to look at is the USC government overlay, also known as the United States Code. Now this overlay is actually an entity itself, an organizational structure. However, it's designed to appear, like the chameleon, as the environment of the constitutional republic. However, the two entities are completely separate. The constitutional republic of the United States of America is no longer in existence as far as an organization goes. Instead, what we have is the United States Code government which is broken down into the titles on a uh, large document. Now, in the U.S. Constitution, you have um, three branches of government, like the branches of a tree, right? Three different sections. And those would be the judicial, the presidential or executive, and the... Um, Congressional, right? The Congress, all that. Now, the U.S. Constitution, of course, was revised, which is another overlay. 
Well, it's not really an overlay. That is actually changing the original document. That doesn't have to do with an overlay. All the other overlays are applied to the Constitution with different versions that are postulated and then all of the quoting out of context that is done in relation to the Constitution, which all has to do with fork tongue double speak type of thing. However, when it comes to the USC government, it is very apparent how different it is from the Constitution, although it does form itself under the appearance of being constitutional, thus providing the overlay a lens with which somebody might view the Constitution in a different manner. So in the U.S. Code, we have Title I General Provisions, and this, of course, is like the preamble in the Constitution where it's defining what the U.S. Code is for, whereas the preamble in the Constitution defines what the Constitution is for. Title II has the Congress, and naturally, Article I in the Constitution has their Congress, or the Constitutional Congress. And then Title III has the President. Interestingly enough, there is no then Title IV that talks about the judiciary. Instead, we have Title IV flag and seal, seat of government, and the states. So the flag that we have right now, that was so-called Stars and Stripes, is the flag of the U.S. Code government. Now it's probably modeled somewhat off of the Constitutional Republic government because this U.S. Code government is like a chameleon attempting to make itself appear as the Constitutional government or Republic. The seat of government, of course, is going to be Washington, D.C., their capital of the U.S. Code government and then the states. So, so the states are delineated in Title IV as a complete, completely separate. In, For an example, in the U.S. Constitution, most requirements and responsibilities about how things are done goes under Congress. However, in the U.S. Code, Congress is delineated very specific uh, responsibilities and duties. They're basically just a public relations uh, a face under the U.S. Code. They're not an actual uh, legal instrument as might be on the Constitution, which is are the people. Legal instrument being the entity that writes uh, legal or lawful paperwork. Instead, they're just uh, an entity that is taking on the appearance of the Congress under the U.S. Code and all of the other titles are specific to what those sections are going to be done. So whoever writes the titles in the U.S. Code government is the one writing the law. It's not the Congress. In the U.S. Constitution, the ones writing the laws are the Congress. And that's a very big difference. So in the current system of the U.S. Code government that we have today, people vote in members of Congress, and all they're doing is voting in talking heads, people who are public relations. And, of course, even those votes are controlled under the election title of the U.S. Code. In the Constitutional Republic, members of Congress are voted in, and they make the decisions, they write the laws. Right, So they're two completely different entities. The U.S. Code government is a essentially foreign-held corporation, which is presenting itself as the Constitutional Republic, but in fact is not, because in the Constitutional Republic, people adhere to the U.S. Constitution. In the U.S. Code government, people, or their so-called law enforcement, adhere to the codes. Property, uh, intellectual property of the International Code Council. Under Title I, we have general provisions. Title II is the Congress. Title III is the President. Title IV is the flag and seal seat of government in the states. Title V is government, organization, and employees. Obviously not purview of the President, but purview of Title V. Title VI is domestic security, and that relates to the Second Amendment, but the U.S. Code does not follow the Constitution it simply pretends to be formed under the Constitution. Then Title VII is agriculture, Title VIII is aliens and nationality, Title IX is arbitration, Title X is armed forces, Title XI is bankruptcy, and Title XII is banks and banking. And I'm not going to go through every single title, there are many. In the Constitution, a lot of these 
elements are stipulated under Congress, under Article I, the congressional makeup, right? Congress is charged with responsibility of making uh, uniform rules for bankruptcy and naturalization. They are also charged with the form, uh, formulation of, of uh, arming and regulations as far as the armed and naval, for, uh, all the armed forces go, right? In the Constitution, the armed forces are the militia and the land and naval forces. However, under the U.S. Code government, which is not constitutional, the armed forces are governed under Title 10 and are not the responsibility and duties of the Congress. So that is something very important. What we're dealing with today is the overlay of the U.S. Code government, a separate entity, in which all of the powers and all of the duties and responsibilities are regulated under each title, and the heads of those titles, say the secretaries, the department heads or whatnot, they're the ones in charge of that particular quote-unquote jurisdiction or spoken oath of that section, not the constitutional elements because they aren't constitutional. Everything under the United States Code is separate and therefore inimical to the Constitution because as the saying goes, you can only have one big dog on the block, right? And so the U.S. Code government kicked out the Constitutional Republic while pretending to be so and kicked it out under fraud and during the so-called U.S. Civil War period. Now the next, uh, shall we say, pattern with these overlays, we'll look at the La Grande Armée was the main military component of the French Imperial Army commanded by Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte during the Napoleonic Wars from 1804 to 1808. It won a series of military victories that allowed the French Empire to exercise unprecedented control over most of Europe. And, of course, naturally, this is being viewed through the juridic lens where it does not recognize the elements of individuals, but simply the juridic entity as though it were an individual. And that's another overlay, but uh, that overlay, essentially, I've done in other videos, including the superior race of the juridic people, which can be found in my older publications. So here we have the Grande Armée, named for the alleged uh, Imperial Army of France under Napoleon. Then, according to the United States Code, the so-called Union or United States Army or Department of the United States Army or War Department or however many other ways they're called, was actually called the Grand Army of the Republic. Then we have the Republican Guard, 1969 to 2003, allegedly elite military branch of Iraq's military. The Ira this is Wikipedia, so, you know, fork tongue and all that. The Iraqi Republican Guard was a branch of the Iraqi military from 1969 to 2003, which existed primarily during the presidency of Saddam Hussein. It later became known as the Republican Guard Corps, and the Republican Guard Forces Command with its expansion into two corps. Now, uh, as we saw before with the Grand Armée, this Wikipedia entry is using the juridical lens of an entity, or a the juridic entity, the idea that a group or organization forms itself into itself an individual and thus can completely uh, overlook the components of individuals or the additions of individuals, right? Referring to a group or organization as it, and eventually they will be referring to it as he or she, as though it were a natural person. It's put essentially in over a natural person as being superior to and also this is stating that it was primarily during the presidency of Saddam Hussein what on earth could that that means absolutely nothing because allegedly Saddam Hussein was not you know in pre if, if that they're just saying that it was a period of time 
that most of the time it was under the presidency of Saddam Hussein. Well, that's that's a, a temporal thing. That's something that has to do with time. But it's saying primarily, which could mean many different things, and here in this case means absolutely nothing. Then we have China. Officially, the People's Republic of China. PRC is a country in East Asia with population exceeding 1.4 billion. It's the world's second most populous country after India and contains 17.4% of the world's population. And, of course, here's that doublespeak again. It's a Republic of China, but it's not the people, it's not the Republic for the people of China, right? It's not domestic. It's foreign-owned, just like everything else is. It has no desire as a juridical entity and organization structure to benefit the people that live in the region. Instead, it benefits the people, uh, the foreign peoples, the United Nations. And those are the peoples that's the republic of those peoples over China. And that's the way to look at it. Just like we see the pattern there. So here we see the pattern of republic being used with the Republican Army, the Grand Army of the Republic in the United States, and then the People's Republic of China. These are the tactics of the mimic and the overlay at work here, in which they are forming themselves to the environment to appear to be one thing, when in fact they are not actually part of that environment. Now we come to the overlay idea of juridical entities as far as it regards land and location. The uh, so-called country of Israel, for instance, is a juridical entity that was formed relatively recently and is placed as an overlay to distract and, of course, to uh, solidify the claim that uh, all of the things in the Bible relate to this particular geographical location. When, in fact, the so-called country of Israel was a relatively recent construction and is a juridic entity, it is a location overlay. Same goes with Palestine, which was a relatively recently formed juridical entity uh, to create the uh, physical location overlay of the British mandate of Palestine, anyway. And... That predated the juridical entity of Israel, but both equally are juridical entities constructed by foreign interests. And anybody who fights over these things is fighting over um, nonsense, basically. Thing overlays that were created with the intention of misdirection and confusion as regards uh actual geographic location, which the same example for this would be somebody who takes an overlay of a completely different map and then puts it over a, another map and then states that these maps are the same when they're not. And that's what's going on here. Then you have the locational overlay of Ire Land, which has in its name both Ire and Land. But the location of Ire land might not actually be the land of Ire. But who really knows? And then we have Romania, which is uh, going to lead us into our next part of this location concept in and overlay. Then we have Greece. And... The overlay of Greece is a very important one because the locational juridical entity of Greece, just like Israel and Palestine, is a relatively recent construction. And it is done to obfuscate and place a geographical overlay to explain away certain elements of the past. Now, for the solidification of this overlay, the misrepresentation and creation of the fictional character of Alexander the Great is made to explain how this juridical entity recently created of Greece in the past was able to conquer as an empire militarily many parts of the world, which functions very well to explain all of the patterns of elements that can be found 
across a large spectrum and would be problematic to uh, to look at through the idea of international interconnected trade and understanding and some sort of shared uh, shared uh, identity across many different areas. Well, that has to be um, has to be uh, centrally located in Greece to create that that overlay. This false overlay that they make to uh, explain those problematic elements of the past. This Alexander the Great myth that they create, centrally located in the juridical creation of Greece, explains away the elements of so-called Greek architecture and uh, art and other things in that way, coinage and commerce and whatnot in this state of India, and here you even see Indo-Greek Kingdom set up there, Alexandria of the Indus, and so you see the overlay being emplaced uh, everywhere through the um, control of communication methods and uh, various learning resources. Then we have Bactria, and here with the Wikipedia hits results that you get when you search it, you'll find how misleading they are about this particular uh, element. Here it states Bactria or Bactriana was an ancient Iranian civilization in Central Asia based in the area south of the Oxus River, north of the mountains of the Hindu Kush, an area within northern, north of modern Afghanistan. So here you see that they are emplacing two overlays. First, you have the modern or relatively recently incorporated juridical entity of Iran and the relatively recently incorporated juridic entity of Afghanistan, both of which did not exist at the time but are being emplaced as overlays over the term Bactria. Bactria was strategically located south of Sogdia in the western part of the Pamir Mountains. Of course, who knows if they called them Pamir Mountains. That's another overlay. Bactria, one of the early centers of Zoroastrianism. Another overlay is the term Zoroastrianism. And capital of the legendary Kayanian dynasty. Another overlay, call, calling something the Kayanian dynasty. They didn't call themselves that, most likely. Bactria is, and they probably weren't dynasty. Bactria is mentioned in the Behistun inscription of Darius the Great. As one of the satrapies of the Achaemenid Empire, it was a special satrapy ruled by a crown prince or an intended heir. And there you go with yet another overlay, the idea of a so-called crown prince or intended heir, even though they probably didn't have either of those in the context being used here. Also, Darius the Great is similar to the overlay of... Uh, of... Uh, Solomon or Suleiman, which means peace. And in general, Suleiman and Solomon would not have been actual individuals, but would rather have been a term to cover a period of peace. The rule of peace, as it were, versus the rule of the individual named peace, Solomon or Suleiman. And here we see, even though an absolutely zero reference was made to Greece in those Wikipedia entries, here we find the Greco-Bactrian Kingdom. And so, yes, you have so many different overlays going on there. You have Alexandria and Arcosia, Alexandria and the Caucasus, Alexandria Escate. So there you see they are imposing the overlay there. Now, those places might actually have been called Alexandria in some form, where that word meant something else and did not, did not denote an individual, a general, or captain of huge military um, abilities who just went really far and then died randomly. Right? Their, their narrative around the Alexandria, the great Greek Empire that originated out of this place in 
the Mediterranean. That seems like all of their other lies that they use to claim ownership or, uh, ter over territory, uh, saying that they, they were there first, basically. Or they conquered that place through arms and thus have a claim to it. And naturally, the United Nations is located in Europe. So go figure. Now we have a different overlay when we look at Dutch. Now, German in Dutch is Deutsch, or D-U-I-T-S, pronounced essentially Dutch. So Dutch is in fact German, and German is Dutch. Also in Germany, German is pronounced Deutsch, and of course the land of Germans is Deutschland. And so the overlay of Germany and of the Netherlands, or the Dutch, those overlays confuse the issue that you can clarify when you understand the languages and how German is Deutsch and German and Dutch is Dutch and Dutch is German. Now the statue of Atlas is depicted as an individual holding up the world and they reference this as a literal individual mythological entity, a titan, who is capable of doing all of these great things and is depicted as a strong man, right? A fictional individual, not a metaphor or an algorithm, uh, allegory or uh, some, some reference to something completely different represented as a man with a, a world. No, it's a literal fictional man with holding up the, the globe, right? It's the same thing they do with anything with, um, their overlays where they will make something literal that isn't or make something that is literal to not be literal. Now we have Atlantis, allegedly ancient Greek, uh, Romanized Atlantis Nessos, island of Atlas, is a fictional island mentioned in Plato's works Timaeus and Critias, another overlay, as part of an allegory on the hubris of nations overlays and also ignorant commentary here. In the story, Atlantis is described as a naval empire that ruled all western parts of the known world, making it the literary counterimage of the Achaemenid Empire. Literary counterimage of the Achaemenid Empire. There's, there they're adding another lens, another overlay, another way to distort your viewpoint of such a thing. After an ill-fated attempt to conquer ancient Athens, Atlantis falls out of favor with the deities and submerges into the Atlantic Ocean. Since Plato describes the Athens as resembling his ideal state in the Republic, the Atlantis story is meant to bear witness to the superiority of his concept of a state. Naturally, if you believe any of this overlay, then you will have your viewpoint towards this particular subject completely obfuscated. But that's okay it is very easy to remove that lens by looking at the pattern of words. And in the pattern of words, we come to Atlan. Atlas, Atlantis, Atlan. Right. And there's more patterns too. It is the central home of the Aztec peoples. The word Azteca is the Nahuatl word for people from Atlan. So here you have multiple overlays at work just like with all the other things, ways to obfuscate the viewpoint towards these particular subjects. From which was derived the word Aztec. Atzlan is mentioned in several ethno-historical sources, and there's another overlay, the label ethno-historical. Dating from the colonial period, another overlay, colonial period. And while the each site varying lists of the different tribal groups who purchased tribal groups is an overlay, who participated in the migration overlay migration from Aztlan to central Mexico the Mexica overlay adding that word there Mexica versus Mexico that's the gender studies crap that they're trying to insert into all languages today including Spanish who later founded Mexico Tenochtitlan and there's another overlay who later founded Mexico dash Tenochtitlan Mexico, of course, being a modern juridic entity formed much, uh, much more recently, are mentioned in all accounts. 
Historians have speculated about the possible location of Atzalan and tend to place it either in northwest Mex northwestern Mexico or the southwestern United States. And there they have, have commentary and speculation, thus taking control of that particular term and adding all their overlays to it, Atzalan. Although whether Atzalan represents a real location or is purely mythological is a matter of debate. And they'll let you know once they figure it out. And whatever their narrative goes, you guarantee it's going to be populated across every possible avenue and anything else that is to the contrary will be silenced and removed. So then we come to Atlixco. It's a city in the Mexican state of Puebla. It is a regional industrial and commercial center, but economically it is much better known for its production of ornamental plants and cut flowers. The city was founded early in the colonial period, originally under the jurisdiction of Huitzingo. So jurisdiction being added there is yet another overlay. But eventually separated to become an independent municipality. The municipality, and also another overlay, independent municipality. The municipality has a number of notable cultural events, the most important of which is the El Way Atlixcoitl, a modern adaption or adaptation of an old indigenous celebration. And there you have a bunch of overlays at work. First, you have a modern adaptation overlay. You have the terms old and indigenous overlays. And then, of course, you have celebration as an overlay when it could be none of those things. They're simply just lenses applied to change your perspective about something in particular that more than likely has a, a much more, a much different character to it. But when they add these overlays, it changes the perspective, the perception, the way with which that thing is viewed. This event brings anywhere from 800 to 1,500 participants from all over the state of Puebla to create music, dance, and other cultural and artistic performances. At least go join the UNESCO Global Network of Learning Cities in 2018. So what that really means is that the juridical entity of At least go, already a foreign and foreign-owned corporation, was uh, essentially uh, declared as the subsidiary of the United Nations. Thus, the foreign entity of the UN based out of Europe declares ownership over the region of Atlixco through their overlay of the juridical entity uh, incorporation of Atlixco. Next, we have Mazatlan, is a city in the Mexican state of Sinaloa. See a pattern yet? The city serves as the municipal seat for the surrounding municipio. Well, that's nice. More overlay. Known as the Mazatlan Municipality. It's just ridiculous. This is definitely written by somebody who's being forced to uh, have their work uh, robbed from them in, in the um, garbage school system, or what we call the school system, but really isn't. It is located in the Pacific Coast across from the southernmost tip of the Baja California Peninsula. Mazatlan is an Nahuatl word for place of deer. And there you've got yet another overlay. The city was colonized in 1531 by the conquistadors, where many indigenous people, another overlay, lived. By the mid-19th century, another overlay, a large group of immigrants arrived from Germany. Two more overlays. Over time, Mazatlan developed into a commercial seaport. Overlay, overlay. Importing equipment for the nearby gold and silver mines. It served as the capital of Sinaloa from 1859 to 1873. And there's another overlay, the idea of serving as a capital. The German settlers also influenced the local music, overlays, banda, overlay, with some genres being an alteration of Bavarian folk music, two overlays, actually three or four overlays. The settlers established the Pacifico Brewery on 14 March 1900, overlay and overlay. Mazatlan has a rich culture and art community in addition to the Angela Peralta Theater. And there's more overlays there. The city has many galleries, museums, and buildings of historic value. And just yet more overlays. Now we have Mayapan. is a pre-Columbian, and of course that's an overlay, site of a couple of kilometers south of the town of Telchaquillo in the municipality of Teco approximately 40 kilometers southeast of Merida and 100 kilometers west of Chichen Itza, the state of Yucatan, Mexico. Mayapan was the political and cultural capital of the Maya in the Yucatan Peninsula during the late post-classic period from the 
1220s until the 1440s. Estimates of the total city population are 15 to 17,000 people, and the site has more than 4,000 structures within the city walls and additional dwellings outside. And of course, this is completely full of overlays and is go if you read this on its face and believe it to be true, then you'll have a completely distorted view of the actual uh, object in context here or the object of the uh, of the article, right? The thing being uh, mystified. Here we have a photo, of course, of Temple of Kublai Khan at Mayapan, and that little blurb right below it, Temple of Kublai Khan at Mayapan, is yet another overlay. Anyway, the site has professionally been professionally surveyed. That means it had all of its things stolen and excavated by archaeological teams, like I said. Beginning in 1939, five years of work was done by a team in the 1950s, and additional studies were done in the 1990s. Since 2000, a collaborative Mexican and United States team has been conducting excavations and recovery at the site, which continue and, of course, are done on behalf of the United Nations, not the people that live in the area or that apparently have any claim to it. Now, in Quechua, the word Maya relates to river. In the United States, the so-called Osage, or here it says Neoconska, spelled incorrectly, of the Osage Nation circa 1800, well, they call themselves, or we call ourselves, the Washache or Wajaje, meaning people of the middle waters. And here it states the Osage Grand Divisions of the Hunka and Sishu, Earth People and Sky People, which have yet another overlay being called Osage Grand Divisions, that is, an overlay to make you think of the current use of the term division as simply a divide, when in fact the idea of sky and earth people has different context to it, as does the term Osage. This brings us to the term Midgard in Germanic cosmology, another overlay, anglicized form of Old Norse. And there's a middle yard, middle enclosure is the name of Earth, equivalent to the meaning of the Greek term inhabited. And of course, there they're trying to Im impose their Greek overlay. Inhabited by a known to humans in early Germanic cosmology, the Old Norse form plays a notable role in Norse cosmology. I don't know how many times they can use that word. It's definitely written terribly. This, of course, puts into context the Middle Earth of the Tolkien books with the Fellowship of the Ring, Silma Aurelian, and The Hobbit. Now the next primary overlay, which will break down into subset overlays, because you can of course put more than one overlay over on the same thing. This will be through the lens of language. To start with, we have the term vulgar, which is listed as crudely indecent, an adjective deficient in taste, consideration, or refinement given to crudity or tasteless as in one's behavior. So one can all wonder what crude actually means versus its use. That's something important to make as a distinction. The use of a word versus its meaning. When somebody says a word means something, what they really want to say, what they are saying but really mean is that a word's use is something versus a word's meaning. A word can have many meanings, but a, and a word can also have many uses. But when somebody says that a word is used a certain way, it might not actually mean the thing in which, or the way in which it's used might not relate to its meaning, its true meaning. Because meaning also requires things like word derivation, uh, and formulation, uh, addition, suffixes, all that stuff. Then we have the Vulgate. The Vulgate sometimes referred to as the Latin Vulgate. Yeah, I mean, like that little overlay addition there. Sometimes referred to as the Latin Vulgate. They can add their little overlay of Latin. It's a late 4th century Latin translation of the Bible, and here they remove Vulgate and add Latin. Latin translation of the Bible. So where did the Vulgate name come from, right? The Vulgate is largely the work of Jerome, who in 382 had been commissioned by Pope Damasius I to revise the 
Betis Latina Gospels used by the Roman Church. So one has to wonder what they're obfuscating with these overlays that they're adding to Vulgate and why, in fact, Vulgar has those word uses under the definition. Then we have the Volga is the longest river in Europe situation in Russia. It flows through central Russia to southern Russia and to the Caspian Sea. The Volga has a length of 3,531 kilometers and a catchment area of blah, blah, blah. So here we notice that Volga in Russian, the V is spelled with a B. And often in Spanish, a V is pronounced as a B, whereas a, you also have the name and the, of course, juridical overlay entity of Bulgaria, which one has to wonder whether or not that might also be called Bulgaria. Now this brings us to the Latin overlay, the label of the language of Latin, which allegedly came from Etruscan, yet it is not called Etruscan, and Etruscan is not called Old Latin. So what is going on there? Then you have the Romanche, which is a uh, parent language of many languages, uh, relegated to the Swiss, French, and Italian southern regions, or uh, the Italian northern region, the French, a uh, French region, parts of Spain and Switzerland. Then you have the Romani, also called Gypsies, but who are a people group that are scattered around er, er, uh, everywhere, but they are correlated together with the term Romani or Gypsy, essentially an overlay that has been applied to them, but they could be many different people groups with other identities. Then you have Romania and the language of Romanian, which is also spoken in Transylvania and Moldova, uh, as far as other parts. But anyway, it's officially spoken under the juridical entities of Transylvania and Moldova. And then, of course, you also have Romania. So why is Romanian spoken in Transylvania, Moldova, and Romania? Now, none of these places, people, groups, or languages have anything really to do with the modern location of Rome, or Roma. And then in the overlay of the French language, so-called Roman, spelled R-O-M-A-N, is the word for a novel. One has to wonder if in the future the overlaying so-called historians, or which are rather liars, those that write and speak with forked tongue, one has to wonder if in the future they are going to say that the world was ruled by a vast empire of the novel. And the novel people naturally are the ones that created the novel coronavirus with the intent of wiping out their opposition. And that puts into context the overlay of that term Roman. And lastly, of course, you have the word romance, which apparently has no relation to any of the other elements referenced before, other than the spelling and term. But romance are, is generally derived from roman or novels. Then we have the delineation of American versus British English. And naturally, the label or overlay of American English completely removes the influence of indigenous, so-called, which is another overlay, or the American Indians, another overlay, but the various people groups that populated the United States region, which is another modern overlay. And the linguistic elements that are most obvious is the use of the term uh-huh and uh-uh in uh, a so-called American English, which neither of those terms or words are in fact uh, English, right? Influence from Indians. Obviously, also the um, overlay of the American English label removes the influences of French, Dutch, uh, or German, whichever overlay you would like to use in that context, and all the other possible language influences because it's styled as English. Now also the uh, pretext or concept, the consequence of labeling such a thing as American English 
is to reimpose the declaration that America, quote, quote, or at least the United States, are property of the uh, empire of Britain, the British Empire, uh, because they established the colonies and thus staked their claim over the entire region. And so that naturally anybody is forced to recognize them when they even use the term American English. And of course, naturally, this puts into context the opposing and difficult uh, uh, correlations between Indians from India and then American Indians from the United States continent. That term Indian, of course, being an overlay that is forced upon uh, different people groups and then they're forced in this overlay. And then this leads into the concept of appearance delineating or denoting um, hereditary origin. So the idea of appearance denoting hereditary origin means that whatever you look like, no matter what it is, if you look a certain way and that way of looking has been declared as coming from a certain place, then anywhere you go, you are going to be identified as coming from the area. Now, this takes a different context depending on which location in the world and how much quote unquote development has been done around this overlay. Such as in South America, for instance, if you traveled there and you had blonde hair and blue eyes, then you're probably going to be identified as coming from the United States, even say you came from South Africa. Whereas if you go to the United States and you have that type of complexion, then you'll be identified as coming from somewhere else. So this concept is an overlay enforced upon people by the uh, perpetrator where they decide that that person hereditarily originates from somewhere based off appearance. And we'll see parallels with this in the concepts of eugenics and all the nasty things have been done out about throughout history based only and solely off of how somebody looks. Now with the Arab uh, hereditary appearance overlay, that label Arab is applied to many people, not necessarily being Arabs and not necessarily being from Saudi Arabia or the Arabian location, even though the Ar Arabian uh, overlay is something that's modernly applied to things. And naturally, people from that region look very similar to the quote unquote Latinos, another overlay based off of appearance not only delineating uh, hereditary origin, but stating that they are property of the quote unquote Latin, which is also the language of so-called Rome, which we just recently covered before this. Now, if somebody has certain physical features and skin tone, then they will be instantly uh, required to have hereditarily originated from Africa, right? I don't think we know what I'm, all know what I'm talking about. Now, on the opposite end of the spectrum, if somebody has certain physical characteristics, especially certain skin tone, then they naturally and hereditarily will be enforced as originating from the Caucasus Mountains. So when you talk to somebody who is steeped in these overlays, well, they will emplace these overlays because it's their filter. It's their way with which they see the world. It's just like the land looking through a glasses corrective lenses or a telescope or some other type of filter system, some kind of medium or mechanism to view things. And it distorts the reality. But because they view reality through a distorted manner, whenever they see these things, they will emplace that overlay upon it. And lastly, of course, if somebody has a particular uh, facial structure or appearance, then they will be termed as coming from Asia or the Orient, whereas they could come from some place like Russia or, in fact, even Africa. Now, there is some chemical or, or uh, there is some relatively practical uh, reality to the idea or the overlay of hereditary appearance or eugenics, the 
concept that physical characteristics or traits are passed uh, from one person to the other and can actually be bred out or removed. However, the breeding out is is only one component. They are multiple overlays. So when there's a plant, right, and it's healthy, the leaves appear green. However, with too much or too little water, those leaves will turn into a yellowish, uh, a yellow color, right? And naturally, the makeup of that uh, component of the plant is being changed and the light that you're seeing it through will uh, dictate that. Naturally, somebody who, per, say, perchance is colorblind might not notice the difference, although they might notice perhaps a difference in shade. And, of course, colorblindness is, you know, another uh, issue that leads to a filter, an overlay, a distorted way of seeing things in reality. So we see things through light and how it's the play of light. And so when we see a leaf change color, it's because the light is being uh, reflected in a different manner based off of the makeup of that object. And the leaf, once it turns yellow, will turn brown and fall off, essentially being a dead leaf. Now with a person, if somebody keeps, say, their lips or their skin moisturized and in a healthy manner, then it will appear exactly that. It will appear healthy. However, not taken care of and not moisturized, skin and lips will start to crack just like the earth. And when it comes to having children or babies, when the mother has a natural filter, then the baby will come out healthy. However, when that natural filter is not there through toxification and poisoning, then the baby will come out unhealthy. And thus you have the idea of passing hereditary uh, appearance on based off of the healthiness of the person and we can see this with deformities in children today because of deficiencies and toxins that are being passed on to the child because the mother herself is sick and does not have the natural filter there to keep the baby healthy where the baby comes out healthy but say all of that bad stuff stays with the mother it is well known of course that if you smoke or if you drink or if you have other types of habits like that then those toxins will could possibly affect the baby and that that could comes from whether or not that natural filter is there and so you can't have hereditary sicknesses passed down and whatnot you can also have uh, sickness removed through the hereditary uh, breeding of healthy people where they uh, marry somebody who's healthy and have children that are healthy and so on and so forth they get healthier as it were just like with plants same thing with plants if kept healthy then they will create other healthy plants through their seeds and if they're sick then they'll probably create other sick plants uh, through their seeds and so that is some some uh, rational realistic reference to the idea of hereditarily passing appearance usually though that comes out in extremes such as if somebody's sickly they look sickly if somebody's healthy they look healthy but all of the other traits one has to wonder what exactly are the chemical makeup that leads to the other traits. But either way, when you're dealing with these overlays, it's not about truth or understanding. It's simply about frauds seeking to hide themselves among everybody else and appear uh, blending into the environment. They're the tactics of the mimic and the applications of overlay to cause distraction and confusion. So in this term of physical ailment and overlay, We'll look at altitude sickness. Another Wikipedia entry, altitude sickness is the mildest form being acute mountain sickness is a harmful effect of high altitude caused by rapid exposure to low amounts of oxygen and high elevation. People can respond to high altitude in different ways. Symptoms may include headaches, vomiting, tiredness, confusion, trouble sleeping, and dizziness. And here we have the prevent, pre presenting signs symptoms of high altitude illness, AMS, acute mountain sickness, Nausea and vomiting, heavy head, dizziness, blocked ears, headache, fatigue, lack of appetite, sleeping problem, insomnia, discomfort, rapid heartbeat. Then we have HAPE or H-A-P-E, high altitude, pulmonary edema. That might be edema. I'm, I'm not, I usually think it's called pronounced edema. 
dry cough, nosebleed, shortness of breath, higher temperatures, fever, chest tightness, rapid heart rate, palpitations, congestion, swelling, fainting, a HACE or HACE, high altitude cerebral edema, hallucinations, loss of consciousness, fever and fatigue, photophobia or fear of light, hypertension, confusion, coma, shortness of breath, inability to walk. Now we have malaria. Malaria is a life-threatening disease spread to humans by some types of mosquitoes. It is mostly found in tropical countries. It is preventable and curable. The infection is caused by a parasite and does not spread from person to person. Symptoms can be mild or life-threatening. Symptoms of malaria, systemic high fever, back pain, profuse sweating, lungs, dry cough, muscular fatigue, aches, skin chills, sweating, central headaches, spleen enlargement, stomach nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, blood, bloody stool. So do you see a pattern yet? Those symptoms, I'll just point out, were basically the same as those for high altitude sickness, so-called. Then we have el mal de aire, or bad air, or as they usually say at Mount Ida, is a folks illness in Mexico affecting children and adults alike. It is believed that if cold or nighttime air enters into a body, it may cause pain or discomfort affecting different areas and causing pains like muscle spasm, back pain, or even cold symptoms, say cough, headache, nausea, and vomiting. Now we have miasma theory. Uh, Wikipedia again is an abandoned medical theory that held that diseases such as cholera, chlamydia, or the Black Death were caused by a miasma or a noxious form of bad air, also known as night air. The theory held that epidemics were caused by miasma emanating from rotting organic matter. So I'll go ahead and let you take this one and you can uh, figure out exactly what the overlays are being used there. But either way, there is a actual damaging effect on reality through the applications of these overlays with the intentional design of equally two birds with one stone to cause defeat, dis, um, dis, uh, distraction, uh, confusion, and to cause damage while also equally allowing for those that are not of their environment to blend in and appear as though they were.